So for this session, we're going to emphasize purifying the speech. And since we're emphasizing purifying the speech, we want to use the speech in as virtuous a way as possible. So you'll notice that when we do 35 Buddhas, there's kind of like long way, medium way, short way, um, saying the names three times, saying the names many times, saying the names one time. But also there is a lot of um, multiplying mantras at the beginning. Yes, and some of the multiplying mantras are easy to get your mouth around, and some of the multiplying mantras are hard to get your mouth around, but um, there's a special purpose for each one of them, and that's in the Dropbox um, related to this retreat. If you're curious, Lama Zoparimpshe explains the benefits and the source of those multiplying mantras. The bare minimum is to do Om Namo Manjushriye, Namo Sushriye, Namo Otamashriye Soha and then start the um, 35 Buddhas practice. The rest of them are excellent, but don't feel like you have to. You know, some days you'll have more energy than others. So for this session only today, we're gonna do all of the multiplying mantras, <laughs> just this session. Um, so if you want to be reading along with your screen and then stand up when it's time to do the actual prostrations, that might be useful if they're new to you. Um, so that's what we'll do to start this session and then we'll shift gears after that. So if you wanna get yourself ready for 35 Buddhas, here we go. Establish the visualization and the space in front. Reconnect with refuge and bodhicitta. Generate the power of regret. Add the multiplying mantras. Om Namo Amenju Shri A Namo Su Shri A Namo Otamo Shri A Soha Om Namo Amenju Shri A Namo Su Shri A Namo Otamo Shri A Soha Om Namo Amenju Shri A Namo Su Shri A Namo Otamo Shri A Soha Ocham Din Jai Dejin Jai Padra Jampayam Dava Sobe Sangay Rinchen Gatsala Chat Salo Jam Din Jai Dejin Jai Padra Jampayam Dava Sobe Sangay Rinchen Gatsala Chat Salo Jam Din Jai Dejin Jai Padra Jampayam Dava Sobe Sangay Rinchen Gatsala Chat Salo Om Namo Bhagavate Ranu Ketu Ratsaya Tadagataya Ahati Samyak Sambudaya Tayata Om Ratne Ratne Maha Ratne Ratnam Dinsaye Soha Om Namo Bhagavate Ranu Ketu Ratsaya Tadagataya Ahati Samyak Sambudaya Tayata Om Ratne Ratne Maha Ratne Ratnam Dinsaye Soha Om Namo Bhagavate Ranu Ketu Ratsaya Tadagataya Ahati Samyak Sambudaya Buddha, Tayata, Om Ratne Ratne Maha Ratne Ratnam Bizaye Soha. Oh, Lama to Pacham Dinde, Dejin Jay Padra, Jampaya, Papa Sope Sange Pal, Gawa Shakya to Pala, Chat Salu. Lama to Pacham Dinde, Dejin Jay Padra, Jampaya, Papa Sope Sange Pal, Gawa Shakya to Pala, Chat Salu. Lama to Pacham Dinde, Dejin Jay Padra, Jampaya, Papa Sope Sange Pal, Gawa Shakya to Pala, Chat Salu. Om Namo Dasha Dik Trikela Sawa Ratna Trayaya Nama Pradakshe Supradakshe Sawa Papam Vishadane Soha Om Namo Dasha Dik Trikela Sawa Ratna Trayaya Nama Pradakshe Supradakshe Sawa Papam Vishadane Soha Om Namo Dasha Dri Trikela Sawa Ratna Trayaya Nama Pradakshe Supradakshe Sawa Papam Vishodane Soha.
Om Namo Dasha Deep Tree Kela Sawa Radha Trayaya Namo Pradakshe Supradakshe Sawa Papam Vishadane Soha Om Namo Dasha Deep Tree Kela Sawa Radha Trayaya Namo Pradakshe Supradakshe Sawa Papam Vishadane Soha Homage to the Confession of a Bodhisattva's Downfalls. I Throughout all times, take refuge in the Guru, I take refuge in the Buddha, I take refuge in the Dharma, I take refuge in the Sangha. I, throughout all times, take refuge in the Guru, I take refuge in the Buddha, I take refuge in the Dharma, I take refuge in the Sangha. I, throughout all times, take refuge in the Guru, I take refuge in the Buddha, I take refuge in the Dharma, I take refuge in the Sangha. To the Guru, Teacher, Bhagawan, Tathagata, Arhat, Perfectly Complete Buddha, Glorious Conqueror, Shakyamuni Buddha, I prostrate. To Guru, Teacher, Bhagawan, Tathagata, Arhat, Perfectly Complete Buddha, Glorious Conqueror, Shakyamuni Buddha, I prostrate. To Guru, Teacher, Bhagawan, Tathagata, Arhat, Perfectly Complete Buddha, Glorious Conqueror, Shakyamuni Buddha, I prostrate. To Tathagata, thoroughly destroying the Vajra essence, I prostrate. To Tathagata, thoroughly destroying the Vajra essence, I prostrate. To Tathagata, thoroughly destroying the Vajra essence, I prostrate. To Tathagata, radiant jewel, I prostrate. To Tathagata, radiant jewel, I prostrate. To Tathagata, radiant jewel, I prostrate. To Tathagata, King Lord of the Nagas, I prostrate. To Tathagata, King Lord of the Nagas, I prostrate. To Tathagata, King Lord of the Nagas, I prostrate. To Tathagata army of heroes I prostrate, to Tathagata army of heroes I prostrate, to Tathagata army of heroes I prostrate. To Tathagata delighted hero I prostrate, to Tathagata delighted hero I prostrate, to Tathagata delighted hero I prostrate. To Tathagata jewel fire I prostrate, to Tathagata jewel fire I prostrate, to Tathagata jewel fire I prostrate. To Tathagata jewel moonlight I prostrate, to Tathagata jewel moonlight I prostrate, to Tathagata jewel moonlight I prostrate. To Tathagata meaningful to see, I prostrate. To Tathagata meaningful to see, I prostrate. To Tathagata meaningful to see, I prostrate. To Tathagata jewel moon, I prostrate. To Tathagata jewel moon, I prostrate. To Tathagata jewel moon, I prostrate. To Tathagata stainless one, I prostrate. To Tathagata stainless one, I prostrate. To Tathagata stainless one, I prostrate. To Tathagata bestow with courage, I prostrate. To Tathagata bestow with courage, I prostrate. To Tathagata bestow with courage, I prostrate. To Tathagata pure one, I prostrate. To Tathagata pure one, I prostrate. To Tathagata pure one, I prostrate. To Tathagata bestow with purity, I prostrate. To Tathagata bestowed with purity, I prostrate. To Tathagata bestowed with purity, I prostrate. To Tathagata water god, I prostrate. To Tathagata water god, I prostrate. To Tathagata water god, I prostrate. To Tathagata deity of the water god, I prostrate. To Tathagata deity of the water god, I prostrate. To Tathagata deity of the water god, I prostrate. To Tathagata glorious goodness, I prostrate. To Tathagata glorious goodness, I prostrate. To Tathagata glorious goodness, I prostrate. To Tathagata glorious sandalwood, I prostrate. To Tathagata glorious sandalwood, I prostrate. To Tathagata glorious sandalwood, I prostrate. To Tathagata infinite splendor, I prostrate. To Tathagata infinite splendor, I prostrate. To Tathagata infinite splendor, I prostrate. To Tathagata glorious light, I prostrate. To Tathagata glorious light, I prostrate. To Tathagata glorious light, I prostrate. To Tathagata sorrowless glory, I prostrate. To Tathagata sorrowless glory, I prostrate. To Tathagata sorrowless glory, I prostrate. To Tathagata son of non craving, I prostrate. To Tathagata son of non craving, I prostrate. To Tathagata son of non craving, I prostrate. To Tathagata glorious flower, I prostrate. To Tathagata glorious flower, I prostrate. To Tathagata glorious flower, I prostrate. To Tathagata pure light rays, clearly knowing by play, I prostrate. To Tathagata pure light rays, clearly knowing by play, I prostrate. To Tathagata pure light rays, clearly knowing by play, I prostrate. To Tathagata lotus light rays, clearly knowing by play, I prostrate. To Tathagata lotus light rays, clearly knowing by play, I prostrate. To Tathagata lotus light rays, clearly knowing by play, I prostrate. To Tathagata glorious wealth, I prostrate. To Tathagata glorious wealth, I prostrate. To Tathagata glorious wealth, I prostrate. To Tathagata glorious mindfulness, I prostrate. To Tathagata glorious mindfulness, I prostrate. To Tathagata glorious mindfulness, I prostrate. To Tathagata glorious name, widely renowned, I prostrate. To Tathagata glorious name, widely renowned, I prostrate. To Tathagata glorious name, widely renowned, I prostrate. To Tathagata king holding the victory banner of foremost power, I prostrate. To Tathagata king holding the victory banner of foremost power, I prostrate. To Tathagata king holding the victory banner of foremost power, I prostrate. To Tathagata glorious one totally subduing, I prostrate. To Tathagata glorious one totally subduing I prostrate. To Tathagata glorious one totally subduing I prostrate. To Tathagata utterly victorious in battle I prostrate. To Tathagata utterly victorious in battle I prostrate. To Tathagata utterly victorious in battle I prostrate. 
To Tata got a glorious transcendence through subduing, I prostrate. To Tata got a glorious transcendence through subduing, I prostrate. To Tata got a glorious transcendence through subduing, I prostrate. To Tata got a glorious manifestations illuminating all, I prostrate. To Tata got a glorious manifestations illuminating all, I prostrate. To Tata got a glorious manifestations illuminating all, I prostrate. To Tata got all subduing jewel lotus, I prostrate. To Tata got all subduing jewel lotus, I prostrate. To Tata got all subduing jewel lotus, I prostrate. Tathagata Arhat, perfectly complete Buddha, King Lord of the Mountains, firmly seated on a jewel and lotus, I prostrate. Tathagata Arhat, perfectly complete Buddha, King of the Lord of Mountains, firmly seated on a jewel and lotus, I prostrate. Tathagata Arhat, perfectly complete Buddha, King of the Lord of Mountains, firmly seated on a jewel and lotus, I prostrate. The Seven Medicine Buddhas. To Bhagawan Tathagata Arhat, perfectly complete Buddha, renowned glorious King of excellent signs, I prostrate. To Bhagawan Tathagata Arhat, perfectly complete Buddha, king of melodious sound, brilliant radiance of skill, adorned with jewels, moon, and lotus, I prostrate. To Bhagawan Tathagata Arhat, perfectly completed Buddha, stainless excellent gold, illuminating jewel who accomplishes all conduct, I prostrate. To Bhagawan Tathagata Arhat, perfectly complete Buddha, glorious supreme one free from sorrow, I prostrate. To Bhagawan Tathagata Arhat, perfectly complete Buddha, melodious ocean of proclaimed Dharma, I prostrate. To Bhagawan Tathagata Arhat, perfectly complete Buddha, king clearly knowing by the play of supreme wisdom of an ocean of Dharma, I prostrate. To Bhagawan Tathagata Arhat, perfectly complete Buddha, medicine guru, king of sapphire light, I prostrate. All you 35 Buddhas, seven medicine Buddhas, and the others, as many Tathagata Arhat perfectly completed Buddha Bhagawans, as there are abiding, living, and residing in all the world systems of the ten directions, all you Buddha Bhagawans, please pay attention to me. In this life and in all the states of rebirth in which I have circled in samsara from beginningless lives, whatever negative actions I have created, made others create or rejoice in the creation of, whatever possessions of stupas, possessions of the sangha, or possessions of the sangha of the ten directions that I have appropriated, made others appropriate or rejoice in the appropriation of, whichever among the five heavy negative karmas without break I have done, caused to be done, or rejoiced in the doing of, whichever the ten non-virtuous paths of action I have engaged in, caused others to engage in, or rejoiced in the engaging of, Whatever I have done, being obscured by these karmas, causes me to be born as a sentient being in the hell realm, in the animal realm, or in the preta realm, in an irreligious country, as a barbarian, or as a long-life god, with imperfect faculties, holding wrong views, or not being pleased with the Buddha's descent. In the presence of the Buddha Bhagawans, who are transcendental wisdom, who are eyes, who are witnesses, who are valid, and who see with omniscient consciousness. I admit and confess all these negative actions. I do not conceal them nor hide them, and from now on in the future, I'll abstain, refrain from committing them again. All Buddha Bhagawans, please pay attention to me. In this life and all other states of rebirth in which I have circled in samsara from beginningless lives, whatever roots of virtue I have created by generosity, even as little as giving just one mouthful of food to a being born in the animal realm, whatever roots of virtue I have created by guarding morality, whatever roots of virtue I have created by following pure conduct, whatever roots of virtue I have created by fully ripening sentient things, whatever roots of virtue I have created by generating bodhicitta, and whatever roots of virtue I have created by my unsurpassed transcendental wisdom, all these assembled and gathered and combined together, I fully dedicate to the unsurpassed, the unexcelled, that higher than the high, that superior to the superior. Thus, I completely dedicate to the highest, perfectly complete enlightenment. Just as the past Buddha Bhagawans have fully dedicated, just as the future Buddha Bhagawans will fully dedicate, and just as the presently abiding Buddha Bhagawans are fully dedicating, like that, I too dedicate fully. I confess all negative actions individually. I rejoice in all merits. I urge and request all Buddhas. May I achieve this supreme, holy, peerless, transcendental wisdom. To the conquerors, the best of humans, who are living in the present time, who have lived in the past, and who will likewise come, all those whose qualities are as vast as an infinite ocean, with hands folded, I approach for refuge. The General Confession. Who who la, woe is me. Great Guru, Vajadara, all other Buddhas and Bodhisattvas who abide in the ten directions and all the venerable Sangha, please pay attention to me. I, who am named... 
circling in cyclic existence from beginningless time until the present, overpowered by delusions such as attachment, hatred, and ignorance, by means of my body, speech, and mind, have committed the ten non-virtuous actions, committed the five heavy negative karmas without break, and committed the five nearing heavy negative karmas without break. I have transgressed the vows of individual liberation, transgressed the vows of bodhisattvas, and transgressed the samaya of secret mantra. I have been disrespectful to my parents, disrespectful to my Vajra masters and my abbot, and disrespectful to my spiritual friends living in ordination. I've committed actions harmful to the three rare sublime ones, abandoned the holy dharma, criticized the Arya Sangha, harmed sentient beings, and so on. These and many other non-virtuous negative actions I have done, have caused others to do, have rejoiced in others doing, and so forth. In the presence of the great Guru Vajadara, all the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas who abide in the ten directions, and the venerable Sangha, I admit this entire collection of faults and transgressions that are obstacles to my own higher rebirth and liberation, and causes of cyclic existence in the lower realms. I do not conceal them, and I accept them as negative. I promise to refrain from doing these actions again in the future. By confessing and acknowledging them, I will attain and abide in happiness, while by not confessing and acknowledging them, true happiness will not come. Through the force of reciting the names of the 35 Confession Buddhas and the Medicine Buddhas, through the power of their pure prayers and vows, through the power of your regret and the other opponent forces, and through the power of your having done these prostrations, nectar and light rays descend from the holy bodies of the Buddhas. All the negative karmas, defilements, and imprints collected on your mental continuum from beginningless time are completely purified. Generate strong faith that your mind has become completely pure. Mantra of Pure Morality. Om Amo Agajala Sambara Bara Bara Ma Shuddha Tatma Padma Vebukita Vutsa Dara Dara Samata Ablukite Hum Pe Soha Om Amo Gashala Sambara Bara Bara Ma Shuddha Tatma Padma Vebukita Vutsa Dara Dara Samata Ablukite Hum Pe Soha Om Amo Gashala Sambara Bara Bara Ma Shuddha Tatma Padma Vebukita Vutsa Dara Dara Samata Ablukite Oh, <laughs> Mamo Gashala, some bara 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 ma, should a seven pema vego kita, puts a dara dara, some ata, hello kite um pe so ha. O Mamo Gashala, some bara 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 ma, should a seven pema vego kita, puts a dara dara, some ata, hello kite um pe so ha. O Mamo Gashala, some bara 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 ma, should a seven pema vego kita, puts a dara dara, some ata, hello kite um pe so ha. O Mamo Gashala, some bara 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 ma, should a seven pema vego kita, puts a dara dara, some ata, hello
prayer to keep pure morality. By abiding in faultless morality of the Dharma rules, completely pure morality, and morality free from conceit, may I complete the perfection of morality. The Buddhas then dissolve into one another. The Medicine Buddhas up into the Karma family, up into the Lotus family, up into the Ratna family, up into the Tathagata family, up into the Vajra family, into Shakyamuni Buddha, into you. Thank you so much for um, being patient with that process. I know it can be a lot if it's your first time, but it certainly is going to be a way to help you purify your speech. So if you had um, a particularly unfortunate conversation with someone and you really want a supercharged purification, doing the long version of 35 Buddhas with all the multiplying mantras helps purify that plus huge amounts of merit. Um, so anyway, it's good to know that that one exists, but don't feel pressured to do it in that longest form each time. The short form is totally acceptable and really very powerful on its own. Yeah, go ahead, um, Karen. So um, when we say purify, Again, we're talking about stopping the multiplication, or are we talking about purifying? We're, we're, stopping, we're stopping the multiplication, but we're also purifying in the sense of the seeds can't bear the fruit of suffering, which is true of Vajrasapa as well, right? The seeds can't bear the fruit of suffering. The seeds are burnt, but that doesn't mean they don't have any effect whatsoever. There's still imprints, which can only be removed once you've realized emptiness. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah, but no, in this case, it's it's a amazing full purification, body, speech, mind, supercharged purification. And also, I guess what's different um, to Vajrasattva besides the obvious is that it also accumulates merit, huge amounts of merit. Not to say that Vajrasattva doesn't, but there's a huge amount of merit accumulated with 35 Buddhas, very intentionally built right into it. So that's good to know as well. Yep. physical, verbal, and mental good karma is created. So it's an efficient and tidy little practice. Um, a good kind of way, if you want to get really into purification as part of your practice, is 35 Buddhas in the morning, purification with Vajrasattva at night. But you can swap them anytime or just pick one or alternate. That's totally fine too. But um, a nice launch for the morning is like what we did this morning, just a little bit of nine round breathing, a little bit of stabilizing meditation, then 35 Buddhas. Then off to work, you know, that could be your whole morning practice. And then you do more analytical meditation later in the day or deity practice or whatever you like. And then at the end of the day, you do your Vajrasattva and maybe also a little bit of Shamatha. That would be a really solid practice. If you did only that the rest of your life, that would be amazing. And then if you have mental space to weave in more like, you know, a Tara Sadhana or a analytical meditation on patience or, you know, focusing more in on working on your Shabbata as the main project, all of that is wonderful, but kind of getting that bookend structure to your practice, something in the morning, something at night, bit of purification and merit making in the morning, bit of purification, merit making at night. It's, it's a really solid way to not let life kind of slip away from you because the days just fly by, don't they? Yeah. Yeah, other questions about 35 Buddhas before we um, do another row? So we are up to the Amitabha Lotus family aspected ones. So they purify the discernment aggregate. Sometimes this is called the aggregate of recognition. So they purify that aggregate and they purify attachment and also help develop discriminating wisdom or the wisdom of recognition. So the first one is the son of non-craving. And the son of non-craving, Nultu Dhammabhadra says, 10,000 eons of negative karma are purified. And Galsabje says, whatever imprints left on the mind by having created negative karma are purified. So terms and conditions apply as always, but a huge amount gets shifted when working with that one. <clears throat> Glorious flower purifies the negative karma collected with the body, which means through physical actions. Gelsub J says 100,000 eons of negative karma are purified. After Shakyamuni Buddha's verse, 
This one purifies the greatest amount of negative karma. Then pure light rays, clearly knowing by play, purifies negative karmas collected with speech. According to Notre Dhamma Bhadra, 1,000 eons of negative karma are purified. Then lotus light rays, clearly knowing by play, purifies seven eons of negative karma. Glorious wealth purifies imprints left on the mind by committing negative karma and engaging in activities that pollute the Sangha. Glorious mindfulness purifies the negative karma of having criticized holy beings. And glorious name, widely renowned, purifies the negative karma collected with the body through physical actions. It purifies the negative karma of being unhappy with a Buddha descending to this world. Instead of rejoicing, you feel the opposite. Yelsev Jay also mentions that negative karma collected through jealousy is purified. So with these ones, um, you know, it's mostly just about each one has a lot of power. They've done a lot of aspirational prayers. Lots of eons are purified by saying each one. They're not particularly indicating attachment specifically. Some of them, you know, kind of in the background are referencing that. Some body, some speech, some mind, some miscellaneous. Um, when you're directing your mind in that general way that's just focusing on purifying one affliction, it can help to really just think attachment <laughs> yeah but knowing that it's attachment plus all these other things get purified as well so when we're thinking about attachment just keep remembering it's not the normal way of using the word we're not talking about attachment parenting we're not talking about having secure attachments we're not talking about anything like that from the colloquial perspective that attachment in buddhism means exaggerating the good qualities so there are good qualities of a person or a situation or an object. They have, they have good qualities, right? But attachment sees those good qualities in isolation from the rest of the story of that person, object, or situation. It sees it in isolation. It doesn't see also the bad, also the neutral, also the changeability. It only sees the good. And by only seeing the good, then you make plans and hopes and expectations that are doomed to fail because it's already built on an exaggeration, right? Which is why when attachment doesn't get what it wants, that thwarted attachment turns so swiftly to anger. We feel like we've been lied to or let down by the person, the object or the substance, like they didn't live up to what they said they were, but were they really saying that? <laughs> it was just a good day snapshot in our mind. And then we decided that's who they are all the time when that's only who they are sometimes. So I think we know this about attachment, but it's just important that we really clarify what we're talking about. We're not talking about don't have love. We're not talking about be disengaged, not at all. We need to be very engaged, very loving on the spiritual path. It's just that attachment ruins it for us. And before anything bad happens to our attachment story, it almost feels like love. And it can be very warm and it can be very, um, kind of tempting and tantalizing, whether it's a person or an object or a substance or whatever it is, it feels like it's calling us and that if we go to it, happiness is there. Yeah, at the other, right? And that's occasionally true. It's true enough that we have kind of a Pavlovian <laughs> sort of association, right? You know, like Pavlov dog right so it happens enough that we still bank on it being the case when the story of happiness being at the other end of that is just occasional okay so attachments related to people yourself situations objects everything gets exaggerated and then is doomed to failure so that's what we're going to look at okay with the journaling exercise so um here we go so we're journaling about physically, verbally, and mentally, how does your own personal expression and habit of attachment manifest? And we'll do that for 15 minutes. Do some writing and reflecting on that. And finish up your thought. Okay. 
So um, hopefully that was enough time now that we're kind of like on a roll with the self-reflection. And I know it's a lot of deep diving all for one day. So you guys will probably have a really solid night's sleep. Make sure you, you know, eat good nourishing food, you know, go for a walk if you need to, and just kind of like let your, uh, let yourself digest all of this <laughs> self-reflection. Okay. Um, even though it's not new to any of us, still, it can be a little confronting to go there. Um, so what came up when you were looking at attachment physically, verbally, mentally, how does it manifest for you? Shyness is to be expected with this one. <laughs> <laughs> I I can go. Um, it manifests as uh, worry and anxiety, and I've definitely felt a physical reaction from it. Absolutely, very intense. So, yeah. Yep. <laughs> anxiety. Yep. <laughs> Underlying. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. 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 Anna. It's true. I feel really shy saying this, but I know I feel that aversion. I feel that frustration. I feel let down. I feel like I um, put on that sour face and that person sees that mm. my habit uh, or I look uh, put on a look of shock to the other person like they did something wrong. Mm. Um, it's mostly also in my thoughts. So I do the physical and it's usually mostly in my thoughts that sometimes I also ruminate when things don't go my way or I have that aversion. Um, mostly I notice I used to maybe kind of sort of not argue back, but defend myself. And I saw the silliness in that. So I've dropped that. Excellent. But I, but I wanted to mention that. Yeah, yeah. You'll probably forget anyway and do it again, but no, I'm kidding. So far, <laughs> but, so good, but you're right. So far, so good, right? Look, an attachment is such a monster, and attachment and aversion are best friends, of course, unfortunately. But, you know, to really look at, like, what is the hunger, like, the craving, you know, like, sometimes when they talk about attachment, they say, like, desirous attachment, like, obsession or, you know, lust or whatever, and, and that only really is a thing in our life in different chapters right like but when those chapters are not particularly bubbling up it's not like we suddenly don't have attachment it just takes another form doesn't it like I really want this situation to happen or I really need this person here or this object is going to sort it for me you know and there's just a lot of like certainty that fill in the blanks will make life better sometimes it does never as long or as well as we thought, but there's that like hunger for merging with something. Yeah, you wanna merge with something, a person, a situation, an object. You wanna merge with it because you think that will equal happiness. And it's so hard to unpack it because like take something that we all can relate to like food or something. Yeah, if you have like a certain food that you really, really love and you had a hard day Sometimes eating that food that you love will be nourishing and satisfying and soothing and kind of help your mind be at ease. And sometimes it won't. Yeah, the same food. Yeah, sometimes on a bad day, you go towards that good food, you eat one bite. And before you've even noticed that first bite or enjoyed that first bite, you're anticipating the whole rest of the thing. And you just kind of like gulp it. And you're sort of satisfied, but then also sort of like indigestion and like, oh, that was disappointing. Yeah. You know, it's, it's like the object works in, intermittently because it was never really about the object to begin with. And it's, it's interesting to take something like, say something like chocolate, that culturally most people like chocolate and you think chocolate is going to make people happy. If I give them chocolate, they will be happy. And then you give chocolate to a Tibetan person and they're like, <laughs> right. And they're like, here's some rancid butter. And you're like, <laughs> you know, they love their butter to go a little off because then it has flavor. I know, I know, but you know, for them, slightly rancid butter, happiness right chocolate gross 
So it's also remembering that these things don't exist from their own side. Like we've had a whole context and an upbringing that has kind of conditioned us to think this is the thing that works. And it's that very conditioning itself that gets our mind into an atmosphere that will sort of make it work. But it's never been about the object. So it's it's confronting to look at our attachments. It's embarrassing to look at our attachments. And it's even more embarrassing to look at what happens to us when our attachment is thwarted and we're all embarrassed and, you know, let down. But anxiety is a symptom. Also, depression can be a symptom of attachment, not necessarily, but often. Um, and it's you know, when you confronting these things in yourself, never feel like you're bad or broken, okay? You're not bad and you're not broken. Um, you know, lots of um, young people, especially when I talk to like teenagers and young adults lately, they were so brought up with so much um, like exposure to internet things and they're just such a widespread addiction to content online. You know, whether it's something really obviously problematic like pornography or just like the ability to binge watch many many episodes back to back to back to back to back they grew up with that being such a norm and then they have all this like guilt and shame about it and none of that guilt and shame is going to help them change the habit you have to start with just complete love and acceptance of your own self you deserve to be happy and that's why you're chasing the crumbs of happiness because no one ever showed you what real happiness was. So you go for these crumbs of happiness, like binging content or binging food or binging relationships. And it's to be expected because no one showed you any other way. So, you know, the first thing is like, identify the attachments and then take out the shame, take out the guilt, take out the identification and just say, here's a behavior that was born out of my life. You know, countless causes and conditions. Lots of stuff fed into it. Lots of people do the same things even. I don't have to be critical to myself. I just need to recognize it's not doing what it advertises itself to do. Yeah. Like, for example, if you do get into like a TV binge, right? And you say, I'm just going to watch one episode, just one episode. And then you get sucked in and you watch five episodes. Are you five times happier? probably not probably you get tireder and tireder and tireder but you keep hoping for the fun of the first episode right so it, there's a lie built into attachment and that's part of what helps you disengage from attachment objects is recognizing the built-in lie your attachment says you'll be five times as happy with five times as much viewing and that's not the case it actually goes down yeah karen go ahead So um, I've been gifted with um, retirement, so I have lots of time. Uh, I've been gifted with um, an, a nice, safe place to live, um, where it's generally very quiet, and um, at night people turn their lights off, so I don't have blaring lights, so I can open my window shades and see the sun come up in the morning. And... My attachment is to all of that. Um, I enjoy it, I want it, and I don't want anybody to take it away. <laughs> and so when I have new neighbors, mm. I've been working really hard with this for about a year, new neighbors who have a completely different schedule and don't understand the community and uh, what we have here. Um, boy, it brings up so much anger and um, yeah, so for me, the attachments that I have bring up these um, bad feelings in me, these ungenerous feelings. Yeah, very understandable. Very understandable. I, I, to Instead of like telling yourself, don't feel that way, <laughs> stop having that reaction. Instead, think of times in your life where you've met disappointment or difficulty differently, like for example, there's probably a time in your life where you like traveling or you like camping or you liked being somewhere else and you had less with you 
You know, you had less comfort, less security, less quiet, less cleanliness, less all of that. And, you know, all sorts of noisy neighbors, but you were in the mood for it because you decided I'm on an adventure, right? And because you decided you're on an adventure, it was like life's rich pageant. Yes. You know, like, <laughs> I don't know if you've ever been to India, but you know, like, I don't really want there to be livestock on the bus with me, but someone had brought a chicken once and they just like, there's a chicken there, you know, on the bus and it smells like a chicken is on the bus. And, you know, part of me is like gross, weird, humane. I don't know what's happening, but also stinky. But then part of me is also just like amused. Yes. You know, when you're just like amused at weird, unexpected stuff happening when you're in the mood for an adventure. Yes. And so I guess the, the challenge for all of us is to know what gives us comfort and stability, while at the same time not giving those things too much power. Because the more power you give to them, the more vulnerable you become to losing joy when you lose them. So it's like, how do you use them in such a way where you have broken the spell of thinking that's why you're content? Because there are no doubt times in your life when you've been content with less. And even the adventure of less might have meant you were more happy. You know, it just maybe was that kind of like unexpected up and down happiness, you know, like when you're very young, right? Like when you're a teenager and it's all kind of peaks and valleys and chaotic. We don't totally want that. We do want a stable mind and a stable situation. And it's human and normal to want that but we give too much power to what we think are the ingredients for it you know and so it like on one level it's like you have your i don't know housing association that says here are the hours here's the noise level here is the whatever and then you just try and have a sense of humor about it because people will always find a way to annoy each other right always and so say you lived with people who had all exactly the same values and the same income and the same socioeconomic status and the same background and the same race and all of the same things, you would still find a way to aggravate each other. Definitely. <laughs> like guaranteed. Right. So I think there's also the lie involved with attachment that says, if this, this, and this were in place, it would be perfect. When in fact, if this, this, and this were in place, you'd find something else to ruin your peace. You know, so it's like you hold what's reasonable and rational and you take action when action is needed, but with a lot of humor and a lot of spaciousness, because what you don't want is to give all the power to things that don't even want it or to people that don't even want it. You know, the person coming late at, late from a shift who slams their car door, or drives up in a motorbike and wakes everybody up. They're not thinking, I shall wake everyone up. They're thinking, I'm exhausted. I just got home from work. Park, <laughs> you know? And so you've given them all the power to take your happiness. They never wanted that power, right? And now they're going to feel like, oh, now I'm tired and guilty. Thanks, neighbors. <laughs> yeah. So... I'm sure there's the case where people are actively, actively inconsiderate, actively inconsiderate. I don't know if that's a thing, but you know, they really are selfish and thoughtless and not considerate of their neighbors. And then maybe something needs to happen, but there, there's a million things where I think we could just breathe and have a sense of humor about how fragile we let ourselves become once we get set in our ways. Yeah. And I think we can always challenge ourselves to not get set in our ways, even if we live in the same house for 20 years, it's still something to kind of like break it up, to kind of get ourselves enjoying a routine, but not stuck in a routine, enjoying points of stability, but not banking on them. Because also there might be a flood or a fire or an earthquake and it all goes to hell as well. So when you have this like temporariness feeling even when you're in a stable situation, the temporariness feeling makes you a lot more spacious. Like I, like I often think when I've had difficult job positions or difficult work positions, that when I know the time there is finite, I can enjoy it. And the hard people are interesting and the beautiful things are beautiful. And there's just a lot of spaciousness when you know it's temporary. It's as soon as you think this is my life, that the world collapses in on itself and everything becomes a big deal. So somehow to keep that like 
everything is temporary, even though there's a lot of things that are the same day to day. That temporary feeling, like that holiday feeling, that traveler feeling, somehow touching back into that. Do you do you have a a, a qualm or a, or an argument with that, or some added added obstacles? Easier said than done, for sure. Well, it's a new thought for me, so I'm going to sit with it. Yeah. Um, I think what I um, ended up doing was making myself wrong, um, unloving, unkind, and yeah, created a situation that was unnecessary because they were- You didn't explode, then an implode. <laughs> you imploded on yourself. Exactly. And, you know, they've been wonderful this past, you know, like six months or so on. They understand that they've been annoying me. Um, and so, I mean, I couldn't ask for anything better than that, for, you yeah. know, in terms of our relationship, but in terms of my own progress, I appreciate this new viewpoint. Um, I did I wasn't really thinking about it as being stuck in. So, yeah, I will sit with it. Yeah, it's something about what takes the pressure off the situation. And the first thing that takes the pressure off the situation is to remember it's temporary. So even if they'll live there the whole rest of your lives, still the behavior you don't like changes. It's not like a continuous thing. It's some hours of the day or some times of the week or sometimes of the year, you know, it's like, part, but part of the attachment says you've ruined everything when in fact they've created a disturbance just here, you know? So it's, it's somehow opening the vision back up and just remembering how it's not from its own side stressful but you're not bad for being stressed. It's normal that you're stressed. It's expected that when things don't go your way, you'll be stressed. Be nice to yourself, right? Have a cup of tea, like have a sit, let yourself settle and then think what are creative ways to open back up. Like, I don't know, the bane of my existence when I lived in Israel was leaf blowers, right? Like everyone had like a gas powered leaf blower. They were the bane of my existence. And, you know, I'm sitting trying to do my practice and then, and of course all my windows were open. So then all the dust from the leaf blowers comes in, right? A classic scene, leaf blowers. And I'm like, can you use a broom? You know, but it was going to be every day. And, and I was really agitated every time it came up and I was trying to think creatively. And then I remembered one year, His Holiness came to Australia when I lived in Australia, and there was all these protesters um, protesting His Holiness. You know how there's these fundamentalist groups that don't like His Holiness, right? Mm -hmm. So they had like blow horns and they had drums and they were making so much noise and they had these horrible banners and they were like organized protesters. And the Tibetan community decided what they would do is just go on the other side of the street and just like have a party dance sort of situation and just like make more noise. <laughs> and so on the other side of the street, there's like, you know, like Chinese dragons and drums and like Tibetans doing like that dance with the sleeves. And then when His Holiness drove up, there's one side protesters, one side supporters, but it all just blurred into noise. And this cacophony became really hilarious, you know, cause it's just noise after all. And so I was thinking about, noise isn't problematic from its own side it's how we're branding it and how we're responding to it and that's not to say I ever truly made peace with the leaf blower but it didn't steal as much of my peace as it once did and when I get myself tight about it now it's funnier so it's like if you can laugh yourself out of it rather than shame yourself that's also an interesting kind of thought experiment like how to make yourself amused at your own little mental traps well, I was, um, so the situation is that um, she works until very, very, very late at night. And so she comes home maybe one, 12 or one o'clock at night. So she's got a very clean, clear, loud voice. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's a beautiful voice. It's a very healthy voice. And she'll be outside on, the, on her phone or something or partying. She's decided, okay, one o'clock in the morning, it's time to party outside. And so um, she'll be talking the normal 
volume. And then all of a sudden she'll break out into this huge laugh Mm -hmm. and I'm in bed trying to sleep. (laughs) So what, (laughs) what I decided at one point was she's happy. Yeah. Yeah. Isn't that wonderful that she's happy? Absolutely. So that helped a little bit. It wasn't the whole thing, but um, it helped. And, you know, and because we're talking about purification, it's, it's also useful to think like every time you meet something you don't like, well, you're finishing an old negative karma. It's exhausting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Every time you meet something you don't like poorly, you create the cause for more of the same. So it's, it's powerful. Those times you've been able to transform the mind and it means that you're finishing seeds of that type. But it's also a good reflection to think, when have I been that guy? Like somewhere, some life, probably this life, probably somewhere in adolescence, we were the noisy one, you know, who was totally oblivious of the people around us, laughing and playing our music and mucking about and just like being obnoxious somewhere in our teens, somewhere in our 20s, possibly in our 30s, maybe even now, who can say, right? But like, we've been that guy probably even in this life, the noisy one who was just oblivious. And if we knew the stress we caused to the people, we would be so embarrassed now and be like, oh, I'm so sorry. I had no idea. But we've all been that guy. And if we weren't that guy in this life, definitely we were in the past or we wouldn't be copying it. You know, so that's also helpful to think is like, may I meet them with patience? (laughs) May I finish the habit of being someone like that? And may I remember the pain it causes people, even when they don't mean to cause pain, you know, just kind of like use it as a a tool of introspection or something, you know? Yeah. Anyway, food for thought. Um, Now we'll have a little break for dinner. So a two hour break. And, um, and then we'll have our final session and we'll focus on purifying speech with the Vajrasattva session of that one. And then tomorrow we'll do some mind and some other things like that. So that's what we'll get up to. So I'll see you in two hours. <laughs>